I'm sure internet traffic is heavy this morning, but I'm glad that you have found your spot on the highway and are able to join us today. Lucian's class concluded by opening up the subject of a particular topic that we will now walk through that threshold and give full focus to. Matthew chapter 6, we will soon read a verse from there and pick up where he left off. Matthew chapter 6, I personally cannot imagine living my life without knowing and believing the truths that we will discuss today. And I hope that that's the same for you. First of all, I know what you're thinking. At least one of the things you may be thinking, yes, I'm still in a suit. We're larger than life on your screens today, and we're all we do, we do for God, respectfully. But we're, I'm told by a few who watch lessons after the fact that they get more out of the lesson either the second time or when there are fewer distractions. If that be the case for you, I'm thankful that we can gather in this way and give full focus to the Word. As long as we desire to learn and study and do just that, that's where the blessing comes to us. Regardless of teaching style or method, we give full focus to study how it changes our lives and from this point forward, continue to do our very best. Uh, I believe that exceptional times are great opportunities to learn. And I think we're all going to either be reminded of several things today or even learn a few things that we have not to this point. There are a few points from our lesson today that if you have the outline, you'll be thoroughly blessed by. But the presentation will follow the format but not be exactly what's on your extended outline. And that's a blessing for you. Uh, you can study that outline on your own. But we have some special time together to have further blessing. I look around and I see that the church has left the building. And the joke is, by some of my preaching friends, finally, finally, right? Uh, I think that we are making the most of the opportunity, and I think that you are as well. Just as Jesus said, you would not cover a light uh, by a basket, but instead let it brighten the room. If our Christian light is only turned on when we are concealed in a building, the world will never see. So if we are letting our Christian lights shine more and brighter in our communities as a result of these unusual times, then I rejoice over the good that is being done and will continue to be done for the cause of Christ. Though we miss the fellowship, and we certainly look forward to the next time we can gather, I believe that our lights will shine more and that we can give full focus to this study on a topic that, of course, the elders have specifically asked to address. And I hope that all of the devotional messages that have been crafted through the week and compiled for this time will not shortchange you, but will give you a blessing. There are many points that we will review, and all of them will be a blessing to your life. And this lesson is based on faith. Everything we do centers on faith, and we give full focus to Christ to help us in every time. Maybe more so than ever, we'll see the relevance of focusing on Christ. And we still have a mission that never changes. And that is equipping disciples to make new disciples. Even though you're at home and I'm here, would you say that with me? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. And all of our programs, of course, during normal weeks, and certainly our resources more so, help with that. Your daily devotional studies, starting week number 12, if you started when we did on January the 3rd. Continue to study from other people's hard work to get you back into the Word and see more from it than we can ever may perhaps have seen before as we learn from each other in our own growth. This is the standard in all religious matters, God's Word, and we live on it because it gives us the faith we need. It builds our faith for all things that pertain to godliness and righteous living. That is amazing, and that's the nature of a divine book, and we're going to learn from it today. Genuine biblical faith, what is it? Well, it's a calm trust. It's a calm, faithful walk in a faithful God who promises to meet your needs. Key question, is your faith stronger than the recent attacks against it? There are several foes of faith, and in this sudden and surprised series, we're going to address several of them as long as it takes to make sure we're strong, but Scripture boldly teaches that nothing is more important than your faith, having and holding and growing in faith. Nothing's more important than that. Now, even though scripturally that's true, is that true in your life? And that's the question. What is genuine faith? What does faith mean to you? How has your faith helped you during this time so far? If I were to ask you that question, what are some thoughts that you would put into words and later share with me if we had that time? How are the current concerns affecting your thinking and your feelings and your thoughts and, and your behaviors? 
How's your state of mind? How's your attitude been lately? Are you focusing on healthy thoughts, the positives in every situation? Are you thinking about things that channel your focus towards optimism and, and seeing opportunities to do better and more good for the cause of Christ? Amid all the uncertainties, are you calm? Are you at peace? Are you calm during the uncertainties? And here is a tough one that we'll address in just a moment later. Are you content with what you have? What does faith mean to you? And the first half of this lesson, because it begins in Matthew chapter 6, it's going to be a little bit difficult to hear in the form of reproof, but then Jesus is uh, sternly rebuking certain things. And so the first half of this lesson lays the groundwork, and then the second half of this devotional study will be beneficial and helpful and consolatory to us. And so this lesson is about biblical faith, and this series is about the foes of faith, and there are many. But there's one in particular that we are going to target today and defeat today. We're each maturing. We praise God for that. But we're also human. And let's just be real. We struggle with certain things on a daily basis, some to more degree than others. But we're going to target today how to defeat the foe of anxiety with the weapon of faith. That's exciting, isn't it? To prove our faith Anxious or victorious? That's the question. Again, if you have the outline, the points will be filled in on the screen and you can follow that way. But the presentation will only highlight a few things. I want to begin and end with this devotional phrase, caring is good. Caring is good. Worrying is bad. As we shift gears scripturally to lay the foundation, let's say it this way. Being concerned is godly. Being anxious is deadly, just deadly. Again, how important is your faith? Well, according to Scripture, Hebrews chapter 11 and Romans chapter 5, it says that it is impossible to please God without faith. Well, I need faith, and I want to please God. And also, faith, biblical faith, is how we access the very things that we need, God's very grace by which we are daily blessed and eternally saved. So, scripturally, Faith makes all the difference and should make all the difference in how we experience this life and also where we spend eternity. Yes, it's that important. There is nothing more important than biblical faith, the calm trust in a faithful God. And Satan, therefore, as our formidable foe, most fearsome adversary. He knows how important faith is, and so no wonder he tries very hard to decrease our faith and to destroy our joy. And therefore, we will soon be uh, encouraged and admonished to give more daily attention to increasing our faith and to preserve our very soul's salvation. So six times, Jesus sternly rebukes those who have little faith to encourage them to do more. And the context of the rebuke each time reveals the foe and gives the answer of how to use this tool, this weapon of faith, and conquer it. And Jesus targets our first foe, and that is the enemy known as anxiety. If you want to have a bonus study or two from this lesson, I encourage you to visit our Vimeo page, vimeo.com slash oakhill, and look by date to two lessons that we've shared before, one from a medical perspective, one from a psychiatric perspective, um, and that is the dates 10, 13, 19, 10, 13, 19, and 10, 9, 16, 10, 9, 16. Encourage you to study those. But today we're simply focusing on the general principles from God's word that apply to all of us, no matter how much we struggle with this, because we're starting with Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is tossed into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Wow. Jesus flat out rebukes the spirit of doubt that is manifested by an overwhelming concern over circumstances. And let's just be realistic. We all struggle with that to a degree, if we care at all. And I hope that you do care. So we must ask ourselves the question, are we among the group of people that Jesus rebukes for having such little faith that is manifested or that we experience by intense worry to unhealthy, unpleasing levels of doubt and fear? 
After a preacher preaches against worry, have you ever felt the compulsion, the desire to, to go up to him and say, I, I'm not worried, I'm just immensely concerned. We use those word games sometimes. And for some people, that's true. That's true. Their faith is tempering their concern to not become unhealthy or even sinful. That's true. For others, mm, it just seems to me that they're doing a good job fooling themselves. And so let's make sure we don't do that. Forget everything about anxiety and worry that you know. And let's just give an academic approach first. What is anxiety? Well, simply it is, from a simple word study and in the original language, uh, an intense concern or care about an issue. Interesting. The noun form of the word for anxious means a great care. So in terms of just a word study, wor uh, worry and care and anxiety are so similar that they might as well be twins. Christians are to be people who deeply care about important things. If care is a type of anxiety, am I to avoid anxiety by simply not caring? Uh, some people might think that way, but certainly not. We have cares, and God tells us what to do with those cares, more about that in a minute, so that it doesn't lead to the sin, and we instead have a blessing. You have two extremes. You have apathy, and you have anxiety. Both are deadly and destructive. The balance between the two is, again, what faith is. An accountable, calm, caring, trusting faith. I think Paul had that type of faith, don't you? He had that healthy perspective of concern. He wasn't apathetic and he wasn't sinfully anxious. Some Western thinkers might be persuaded otherwise, maybe even confused when they discover an interesting detail about the original text. Paul often spoke, didn't he, about having a huge care and a huge concern for his fellow Christians. And it's interesting that none of us would question that that concern for his brethren was godly. But the root word that Paul used to describe his own care and burden in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, is the same root word that Jesus used in Matthew 6, 25, speaking against being anxious. Isn't this interesting? So is the Greek text evidence that Paul is guilty of being sinful of the anxiety that Jesus condemned? Let's be careful. Again, how many times have you wanted to go up to a preacher after a sermon against worry and say, I'm not worried, I'm just concerned. I think that if we were to try to make Paul feel guilty for, for this uh, he would preach a sermon to us, rightly so, and correct us for not caring as much as we should about certain things. If you care a lot, that's a good sign. But be careful to be balanced by faith, a faith that casts all of your cares upon Christ. That shows you trust him to take care of it. Point C, uh, again, academic approach, let's just be pragmatic. Uh, points of pointlessness and the problems of being overly anxious. Frankly, it doesn't help. Frankly, being anxious doesn't help. I know it's hard to hear, harder to put into practice maybe, but at least we have to acknowledge it's true and then force us to live by it. Jesus used an idiom. Some of your translations will uh, acknowledge this as an idiom in Matthew 6, 27, really just to illustrate that worrying about your lifespan won't increase it. In fact, it'll do the opposite. But in Luke chapter 12, verse 26, Luke's account quotes Jesus as going a step further and being more stern when he says, if then you can't do such a simple thing as this, simple to God, hard for us, but if you can't even extend your life by worrying about it, why are you worrying about the rest? Are we truly living for eternity? Well, now, none of us want to waste our time and our energy. And this is exactly what worrying is. It doesn't help, and it is, by contrast, other than a healthy concern, wasted energy. Now, if we have healthy concern, it focuses all of our concerns and, and energies towards wiser decisions and helpful productive behaviors, but anxiety is wasted energy and harmful as well. Not only does it not help, it makes things worse. Your physical body suffers from this. You can research this on your own, but how much more should we care about the condition of our eternal soul? That's something to think about. Well, let's shift gears. This point may stand out even more to you, and I, knew, I know it does to me because I did some word studying this past week and learned this just last week. Even though we know it by experience, it just helps to hear it. Anxiety brings division. Division? Hmm. Jesus gets serious about anxiety 
and what I call a faithless worry because it has the power to separate you from God and rip you, uh, rip you apart. Here's an interesting fact. The root word of the verb form for anxious means to divide. It's an intense care. It divides us. Focus, attention. We spend time... Mm, we could spend time, well, actually, let me reword this. You're looking at the outline. We could spend an hour on this, but let's summarize it. We are divided by the very things that we care about. To whatever degree we focus on, that's the degree to which we are divided from other things. We focus on things we care about, and we're told then to not be overly anxious. No wonder the devil wants us to be He's the deceiver, deceiver, he's the perverter, and he will pervert those cares to being overly anxious, gargantuan proportions of intense emotion that's not helpful, and that leads to doubt, doubting the very God that we must depend upon. But if that didn't stand out to you, here's the other key that we can appreciate Christ's wisdom for, Matthew 6, 8, and, or, and uh, Matthew 6, 24. Isn't it impressive that the verse in verse 25 that Jesus says, don't be anxious, comes right after the idea of Jesus saying in verse 24, it is impossible to serve two masters. I'm just now learning that anxiety in its core means division, and Jesus implies this right from the start, two verses back to back. Don't be anxious. It's impossible to serve two masters. Incredible. Whatever we're concerned about is what's dividing us. What's so abhorrible then about anxiety? It allows circumstances to tear us apart from God as we pursue another master. No wonder Satan wants us to yield to that temptation with divided allegiance. We can't have divided allegiance and still be pleasing to God. There is coming a day where everyone is going to realize, and certainly Christians, they will be thankful that they did, to understand in their lifetime here that there is nothing more important than knowing Christ. What does your faith mean to you? How important is faith? We will all experience an eternity of understanding there was nothing more important than knowing Christ. So as uh, helpful as this was to this point, let's not be later regretful for not focusing now in the moment of full trust in God and live by these convictions. And if we struggle with this, the second half of this lesson is now going to be helpful for all of us. Let's look first at the causes and then the cure. The causes of anxiety. And each one of these that Jesus lists is a devotional and sermon within itself. But briefly, our needs. The very nature of our physical body requires a few things to endure. And so we're mindful about that. Matthew 6, 25, Jesus mentions these vital elements for living. To prevent exposure, we need clothing. To hold back death, we need food. Clothing and food. And God created the universe and he created our bodies. He knows what we need, clothes and food. God provides that. There are two dynamics of this theologically. God has, by creation, already given us all the resources we need. We are to be good stewards. But providentially, and for his children, God does work to help sustain us. But the most important thing is not even that. Our faith in Christ. He's already met our greatest need. We should care lots more about our eternity than our mortality. Clothing and food, that's what's listed. And none of today's luxuries are listed in this. Have you noticed that? One hard lesson that people learn during difficult times of sacrifice is the difference between what is a need and what are merely just wants. And we're told to not even worry over what we need. How much more should we be pleasing to God by not fretting over not getting our wants? Luke 8, 14 teaches that even the gospel can be choked out of a person's soul if they care too much or divided too much by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. Those are the three things that people are living for. Their own plans to pursue prosperity and pleasure. That's it. That's what people are living for. No wonder then that they're frantic and full of panic when the threat of those things removed come to their lives and come to their attention. A simple study of the Old Testament, theological point for you, just studying the Old Testament prophets. You'll walk away from such a study with this clear idea that sometimes God does allow, allow certain times of sacrifice to remind his people of spiritual truths that matter most. Regardless of the cause or effect, I hope that people do 
focus more from this point forward on what's most important. Too many people are living for this world, and I truly hope that people start living for eternity. What about our futures? We worry about that too, don't we? Jesus says that we do, Matthew 6, 34. Too many present joys are ruined by the anxious fears of a dark future. Matthew 6, 34, after I read that passage, I think to myself, and maybe your eyes are looking at it right now with an open Bible beside you or in front of you. As a Christian, I am thoughtful, concerned very much so about every wrong philosophy that is embraced and how it eventually affects culture and, and laws and how one reinforces the other and how that ultimately influences the church and your livelihood as a Christian. As a preacher, I'm very concerned always about the ungodly decisions that are made. Even one can affect my livelihood and the livelihood of those who are closest to me. I care about every branch of office, every election, and it does how it does affect my life and yours and maybe your neighbors more than they realize. We all know that our actions have a cause and effect, whether it be good or bad, and we do have an influence. But we also have to accept that individually for sure and, and even a sense collectively, none of us have ultimate authority over the future. And that's why we worry about it. So we need faith in Christ. Now, some people are quick to say, but Michael, I have faith in Christ. It's just people I don't trust. I've thought the same and I've even said the same, right? But I'm careful in a setting like this for sure to make sure my words never imply that people hold more power over the sovereign God as well. We need to focus on that. God, trust in him. He is sovereign. Be careful about the use of the word control. There are things that happen on this world that are not God's will, but God can still work things out. He is in sovereign status. So we care about the future. Resist, however, the trap, the trap of overthinking about it because we just need to be responsible for each moment. See, that, that comes from faith, what we learn from God's word, responsible each moment. And then that calm assurance, focused attention, beneficial behaviors results in a future that is much more pleasant in the present than first feared. What about this? This devotional may relate to you even more. Don't know. Uh, it, it replies to some people more than others. Relationships. We worry about relationships. How does this work? Some of you may have read Galatians 2 and 1 Corinthians 7 and wonder why did I include those passages? Well, the culture of the day was certainly different. There were persecutions going on and how it would affect those who marry into people of other faiths. And, and yet the principle applies to us in other social settings. The principle is a Christian must never become so anxious that he or she is overly concerned with how people treat them. If you're committed to living by the word and if you treat truly are living by the word, then don't let that cause you to compromise when you're wanting other people to focus on you. Lest I go any further with confusion, the key word is loneliness, perhaps, isolation, and a type of persecution. We want to be accepted, and we're certainly missing the time of fellowship. We appreciate God's way so much more, but loneliness uh, how does that relate to relationships and the anxieties and stresses and things that we worry about? Very simple. Christians face a real struggle. It's often unstated, but in times like this, I'll have to be happy to bring it to everyone's attention. The more you embrace and truly live by the word, the more set apart you'll be. Oh, set apart means special, uh, absolutely sanctified. But you might feel so tempted to feel accepted that you will maybe sacrifice some of your godly principles and standards to live by the word in order to have friends. Brethren, this is where we need to step up our game and meet each other's spiritual needs for fellowship in Christ. That way, more people are drawn to the word by seeing it practiced in us, and they see that light and want more of it instead of letting the world win. We eagerly anticipate the next time we can fellowship together, right? Well, let's do that. What's the cure? These are the things that we're concerned about. But here are five remedial and preventative steps to help you and myself, to help us overcome anxiety, keep it at bay, count your blessings. I know it sounds cliche, but that's divine advice. Count your blessings and you will lose count. That's the point. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 26. Uh, Jesus cares about us more than any other creature on earth. 
He'll take care of our needs. He'll provide. He has already blessed us with our physical bodies. How old are you? He's seen us to this point in time. But what's most important? An eternity. So he'll take care of our needs. He's already given us Christ and his sacrifice. Matthew 6, 28 and 30. He continually provides. And I hope that any trial that we go through together, individually, just make us more grateful for what we have, right? Maybe then, maybe then we'll be more like Paul who learned the secret of being content. Points B, be content. Everything on earth is temporary anyway, so whatever occurs, it's easier to manage if you know that it's only temporary. Um, As we think about contentment, being happy with what you've got, I think about how the mind focuses more on the joys of the blessings that you currently have, not on what you don't have. How many people the past week looked at closets and rooms in their houses of things that were just stuffed with uh, items that they had purchased, once wanting the happiness and then going back to it and say, hey, hey, I forgot we had this. And then it brought them pleasant, uh, present pleasure and joy again. So let's look at what we have and never take that for granted. I know it challenges the previous American condition mindset, but this is a good thing. Have you ever noticed that most grateful people are often those most content with what they have. I have noticed that. I read something about gratitude and contentment I'd like to read to you. Gratitude is easier to express and teach. Contentment is harder to embrace and learn. I find that there's a lot of truth into that. Are we really like Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 who learned the secret of being content in any situation? We all admire Paul, but we don't want to go through what he went through, and yet... Maybe that's why he became so exemplary in humility and contentment and gratitude. By his trials, he learned to be content and joyous in Christ alone. And those who are content with God's presence, who truly are focusing on what's most important, are victorious in peace. They are blessed with that peace. The citizens of this world will look at us during this time and see the huge difference. And you can watch the news. You can see a huge difference between those who need Christ and those who have Christ. And we need to be that example. Look through spiritual lenses. I think and I sure hope that more people will become more grateful for what they have and maybe be brought to Christ and be eternally content and grateful. But on a short-term scale, I hope that everyone will at least appreciate during this time all the people it takes to make a society function and how interdependent and connected we are. Maybe more grateful for the things that they previously took for granted. So we need to, point C, prioritize. Prioritize properly. I love the verse that Lucian shared in his class, Matthew 6, 33. He alluded to the concept of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need to care more about what God provides than what we want. God provides what we need. Therefore, we should want what we need. Everything that God offers. I want you to imagine a world where everyone's decisions were first filtered through the prism of what God's will would be in that situation. Whoa, wouldn't that be great? I would like you to imagine a world this afternoon where people are motivated to do good deeds, not for selfish gain, as Lucian mentioned as well, but also or primarily because of the mutual benefit and God's glory. I know, I know. I'm looking forward to heaven too. But while we're on earth, let's show what heaven's like. Let's focus our attention on what pleases God. Letter D, live one day at a time. You can't do anything else. Live one day at a time. This is demonstrated in Proverbs 13, 21, and 31. It's scriptural to be prepared, to be responsible, to plan for the winter during harvest season, right? But being anxious, that's another story. Times of crisis can perhaps help godly virtues. And this generation might be blessed to appreciate the virtues that defined previous generations. I think about as I was a kid visiting my grandparents and I was too young to understand anything other than they're telling me I have to eat everything on my plate. Where did that come from? Even if I don't like it, where did that come from? What did that generation go through? What did they experience? And what were the principles of making sure that you waste not, want not? Remember that phrase? Plan wisely, use responsibly, share generously, and focus on today. And finally, do this all the time, please, steadily. Pray. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. We're coming full circle now. We asked how important is your faith and how it's manifested in your life. To increase faith and be victorious over anxiety. 1 Peter 5, 7. 
cast all your cares upon Christ because he cares for you and he has the power, the authority, the ability to meet our needs. I could have just gotten up here and read 1 Peter 5, 7, but we might have not then appreciated more of the meaning that we now understand behind our closing comments here. Don't try to face your anxieties alone. Don't let them divide you from God, but instead turn to him during these times and grow closer as your trust in him grows deeper and stronger so that you can have peace and wisdom as we grow in faith. Again, that devotional statement Huh. Caring is good. Worry is bad. Being concerned is godly. Being anxious is deadly. Let your faith during these times be proven and purified. Don't let Satan conquer your soul. Instead, be victorious in Christ.